Okay, uh, I think we'll slowly get started now. Uh, most people uh, have had a chance to join the webinar, the Zoom webinar, but people will filter in over the next couple of minutes. Uh, but in the interests of uh, remaining on schedule, I want to get us started here so that we don't uh, run over and eat into people's uh, lunches unduly. Um, so first off, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Dr. Ryan Whalen. I'm really happy to be here today at the invitation of the HKU Law and Technology Center to, to chair this talk and, and moderate this talk. I'm really excited to hear um, what our speaker today has, has to share with us. Uh, the, the structure of the talk will be as follows. So be, uh, initially, we'll give um, Dr. Clifford a period of time to present his work. Um, I suspect that'll be 30 to 40 minutes, although uh, you're free to err on either side of that window um, as you prefer, Dr. Clifford. Um, and as we go along, if the audience has questions, um, please feel free to use the Q&A box. And then in the period after the talk, I'll, I'll pose those questions to Dr. Clifford and we can have uh, a bit of an exchange of ideas, okay? So um, first off, I'm going to introduce today's speaker. Um, Dr. Damien Clifford is a senior lecturer at the Australian National University College of Law, and he's a chief investigator at the ANU Humanizing Machine Intelligence Grand Challenge Project and the Socially Responsible Insurance in the Age of Artificial Intelligence ARC Linkage Project. He's also an affiliate of the ARC Center of Excellence for Automated Decision-Making in Society and at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, which is at the University of London. Uh, so Dr. Clifford, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to, to talk to us here today at HKU and in Hong Kong. Uh, and I'm gonna give you the floor now to, to present your work to us. Thanks very much, Ryan. Um, so I'll just share my slides and I can get started. Okay, so you should be able to see those. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for the invitation and the opportunity to, to speak. Um, so today I'm going to speak about data protection and the accuracy principle in data protection. Um, and I'm going to do it through the lens of emotional AI. So, uh, you know, to start this off, um, I thought that, you know, I'd just kind of give a brief explanation as to what this accuracy principle is that appears in a lot of data protection legislation. Um, essentially, it requires that personal data is kept up to date and corrected or deleted where relevant. Um, and my, I suppose, starting premise, um, you know, for the work that uh, I'm presenting is that, you know, I think this is an underexplored uh, dimension or principle within data protection legislation. Um, Okay, but that's like fair enough. Um, and, you know, you might be wondering why I'm actually interested in it. And I suppose my interest started in accuracy largely because I started to look at emotional AI or effective computing, I suppose, the, the context in which I'm going to be exploring, um, you know, the accuracy principle in this talk. Um, so there are a range of examples. I'm just going to give a couple from Facebook here because um, I suppose when it comes to kind of uh, you know, um, some behavior that has, uh, you know, led to some debates, uh, they provide uh, a few uh, very good examples. So the first one is the emotional contagion experiment, uh, in which I suppose uh, researchers, both at different academic institutions and at Facebook, uh, found that if they manipulated the user feeds of users, they could then um, change how those users interacted with the framework and whether they did so kind of either positively or negatively. Um, there has also been um, leaks around, um, you know, f Facebook saying to advertisers that they can allow them to target uh, teens who are feeling uh, insecure or vulnerable. Um, there are a range of patents um, dealing with emotional AI. And of course, then there's the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which had a clear kind of emotional impact, I suppose, around the, the capacity to persuade. Now, these technologies have been very controversial uh, for a variety of reasons, but some of them have been very controversial as well um, from an accuracy perspective. So there's been wide uh, scale uh, critiques of uh, what's known as facial action coding or the detection of emotions through facial expressions. So there have been a lot of um, discussions uh, more recently um, about the accuracy of such technologies um, uh, in particular. 
So um, the reason I kind of wanted to look at this then is, well, because of the kind of garbage in, garbage out. So if you look at the role of data protection and potentially this accuracy principle um, as uh, a means of regulating um, some of the issues, kind of actually play some sort of a role um, in terms of correcting or uh, requiring the deletion of information that isn't accurate, um, that may play a role, I suppose, in the deployment of these technologies. Now, aside from that, uh, I'm also interested in it because data protection law, and in particular, I suppose I'm referring to the GDPR as a particular, so the general data protection regulation in the, uh, in the EU, as a particularly strong example of regulation that has um, extensive accountability mechanisms um, or tools within it. So you have things like data protection impact assessments or privacy impact assessments in other jurisdictions as they're known. Um, you have requirements for data protection or privacy by design and by default. And you also have protections around automated individual decision making or profiling. So, you know, um, there are robust regulatory tools that could play a role in this space. Um, and uh, through which I suppose we could look at accuracy as a principle and whether it could actually play a role in mitigating some of the challenges. Um, before I get into, I suppose, some of the specifics on this, I wanted to highlight uh, a couple of two preliminary points. So the first is that, you know, um, when we're looking at accuracy, often what we're talking about in this context or any context would be more in the range of kind of accurate inputs. So there's a focus very much on ensuring that the data process isn't, isn't incorrect. Um, and you could say that that kind of reflects the historical roots of uh, these types of frameworks, but also um, their broad goals. So um, their goals, uh, what I mean here is you know, that they're designed to protect uh, privacy and or data protection, but also um, uh, the, the other goal within this is to provide a level of uniformity and certainty to allow for information flows in from, uh, and to provide that certainty for businesses. Now, within that, I suppose, those competing values, um, there is also, uh, uh, I, I think that that's manifested in the fact that accuracy has a bit of an unusual role. Yeah. So in that even inaccurate data are still considered personal data or personal information. So um, it is a principle, I suppose, rather than a strict rule that information has to be accurate. And there's good practical reasons um, uh, for that. You know, um, say, for instance, just a very simple example, if you had, um, uh, you know, provided your address and telephone number and various other personal information on sign up, it, just because you change your address, your telephone number doesn't mean that they don't then relate to you in the future. So this feature of data protection that even inaccurate information um, is still personal information is manifested clearly in different types of frameworks, be that the general data protection in the, in the EU or the Australian Privacy Act uh, within the privacy principles, um, as I've noted there in the slide. Um, but let's look at this notion of like accurate inputs and where it could kind of play some sort of a role then to, in order to, to provide some sort of an illustration. Um, so to do this, I'm just going to use um, uh, uh, this figure that I had um, that I suppose I used in, a, in an article with uh, some colleagues that I wrote. Um, and what I want to kind of highlight is that traditionally, I suppose we would see uh, the role for the accuracy principle in data protection to be everything within the, the red circle. So if it comes within the definition of personal information, there's a requirement to correct or ensure that the information, you know, in your sign up, uh, but also potentially any personal information that might be within uh, the training data or, uh, that might be used to ensure that it is accurate if it is, if it comes within the definition of personal information. Um, now, uh, another point that I want to highlight out of this is that the broadness of your definition of personal data will affect accuracy as well. So what do I actually uh, mean by that? Now, if you have a broader definition of personal information, more information is obviously going to come within it. Um, and that raises potential issues because it, that information may relate to multiple people. So let's take an example in order to kind of highlight it a little bit. So we take this um, graph again, or this figure, which effectively is um, discussing um, the potential deployment of a machine learning system uh, in a hypothetical insurance context. 
Well, if we take the data here that I've kind of circled now in red um, with a smartphone, uh, smartwatch uh, sensor data, um, you know, that device related information would clearly come within the definition of personal information in certain jurisdictions, but there are doubts uh, in others, such as Australia, because that information may not necessarily be about the individual. So, you know, if you're talking about something like an IP address, um, uh, you know, uh, that may relate to multiple individuals, but it still comes within the definition of personal information in the EU, um, even though it may relate to multiple individuals. So the broader your definition of personal information, the more that you have challenges with this accuracy principle. Um, so it does kind of show the flexibility of it um, and that it should be seen uh, as a principle because, um, you know, its operation is a little bit uh, context dependent. Now, within this as well, it's also important to remember that this also relates to so-called sensitive data categories. In data protection, um, in multiple regimes, um, in different jurisdictions, uh, they protect uh, either uh, personal data um, and or sensitive data. So there are certain categories of sensitive information, such as health data, for instance. Um, so um, when we're considering this and considering it through the context of emotional AI, um, we may then start to think about the sensitive inferences that may be drawn from seemingly innocuous device related information regarding, for instance, our emotional state and how we classify those uh, types of information. Are those sensitive inferences potentially sensitive data within uh, the scope of data protection legislation? So let me kind of explain that uh, within the garbage out side of this equation. So if we look at this, then we're uh, looking at the right hand side of our, our uh, diagram. Yeah, so the inferred data output. So, you know, you have the detail processing of various types of information which run through a machine learning model and then spit out some sort of an output. So the question here is whether you know, these potentially sensitive piece uh, information, whether they also come within the definition of personal information or personal data, and whether then the protections that are afforded in data protection law, um, in particular, the accuracy principle also applies to this side of, you know, the equation. So does it have play a role both in terms of the garbage in, but also the garbage out? Um, now, um, you know, within this, I think, you know, we can, uh, there have been some developments and discussions, um, uh, but it would be uh, generally um, accepted, I suppose, and I'll come to this in a second, that, you know, the definition of personal information uh, would be covered within this inferred data output. Um, and there have been some developments uh, recently um, speaking about, you know, um, the uh, overlap and intersection between personal data information and uh, sensitive inferences that may be drawn, uh, particularly in the EU, um, but also, um, for instance, in the reform of the Australian Privacy Act, where you can see here with the ACCC's um, Digital Platforms Inquiry Report, a direct reference to, you know, um, a recommendation that we need to consider the role of uh, inferences. Yeah, so what would happen? Uh, and a further elaboration of that in the Attorney General's discussion paper uh, around whether the categories of uh, sensitive information need to be adjusted to take account of the fact that um, uh, such developments are able to draw sensitive inferences. So, um, you know, we can see um, uh, that there is a role potentially for accuracy, both uh, in the context of the uh, inputs of uh, these types of systems, but also uh, in terms of an output. Um, um, but the next thing then to consider is whether there are any potential weaknesses in that regard. You know, so any potential restrictions um, to accuracy playing a key role, for instance, in regulating the impacts of emotional AI in terms of its inaccuracy. So there are a few here that I want to, to, to highlight. Uh, the first is that, um, you know, when you're looking at data protection law, um, there is an assumption generally that the purposes are legitimate um, and effectively the frameworks are kind of set up as risk mitigation uh, mechanisms. Uh, you know, the frameworks avoid, uh, afford certain rights to individuals to whom the data relate. Um, they place certain obligations on the shoulders of those processing the information, um, but they generally don't um, say anything about the legitimacy of the purposes for which you're actually using the information. 
And generally speaking, if you're talking to uh, particular users, uh, they're often concerned about the particular uses that technology are put to. Within this concern, then you have what uh, Bartiap Kops is referred to as, you know, the focus of data protection being on the upstream, so the input data, as I have put it, as opposed to the output part of it. And the last part then, you know, I mean, we have to remember with on all of this is that even inaccurate data are still considered personal uh, data or information. And therefore, can we really consider there to be some sort of a public positive obligation to mitigate the negative impacts or risks associated with uh, inaccurate outcomes? Um, particularly when we consider that, you know, um, users or consumers will often have agreed to the potential for this risk of inaccuracy uh, when signing up to use the particular service. Um, so we have, I think, you know, some limitations there within the consideration of data protection, um, but maybe to kind of spell out some of that uh, more specifically in the context of emotional AI. Um, okay, so given that inferences are personal uh, data, at least in the EU anyway, um, what role, you may be wondering, does data protection have to play in preventing inaccuracies in the context that, you know, the case study that I'm using to test this a little bit? Um, so um, I, I mentioned, I suppose, that there, there were these white, uh, uh, you know, these uh, broad concerns with the accuracy of facial action coding in particular. Um, but I suppose, you know, there's, uh, just to kind of give you a flavoring of these criticisms, you have um, the AI Now Institute at NYU basically saying that the whole thing is a pseudoscience. Um, and then you have uh, researchers such as Feldman Barrett and others uh, saying that uh, there's a methodological flaw within it in that they rely on what are known as basic emotions, and that fails to capture the richness of uh, emotional experiences. So I suppose there are um, kind of fundamental theoretical uh, uh, debates here as to whether the entire thing is a pseudoscience or whether there is a, a need for, I suppose, some sort of um, methodological tweaking uh, within the development of the technologies to ensure that they um, actually achieve uh, what they set out to do. Um, now, the criticism, um, you know, the response to the criticism that has been there is to kind of adjust some of the methodolo methodologies. So instead of looking at a basic emotion approach, they've adjusted to a more appraisal approach. And that effectively requires the gathering of far more data. Yeah, because it's a far more context aware uh, assessment. Um, and uh, essentially that requires then uh, more uh, information gathering in order to put uh, what is gathered into context to drive uh, more accurate inferences as to someone's emotional state. So within that, then you end up with uh, a question. Yeah, so accuracy, um, say if we take the general data protection uh, regulation in the EU as an example, has a series of principles within it. Um, one of which is accuracy, um, as I've been speaking about, but others include, say, data minimization, where you only have to gather, where you should only gather the minimum amount of information in order to achieve a specific purpose. So, um, you know, adjustments um, here in terms of the methodology require some uh, balancing between the interests of different principles uh, in order to achieve accuracy, if that's worth setting out, but that may then negatively impact uh, individuals vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, um, you know, the uh, more extensive gathering of information. So you end up, I suppose, uh, having to, to question, I suppose, how these uh, various principles are balanced um, fairly. Um, the next key point, I suppose, that I want to highlight is, um, you know, uh, it's kind of a statement, but there's also a question to it, I suppose, is, you know, if there's a flaw in the entire methodology, um, there's a question as to whether it really matters uh, in terms of input or output, um, whether that's accurate. Yeah. So what's the role of data protection law if, um, you know, the entire methodology that is being relied upon uh, is flawed? So um, I thought I'd take again the example of the facial action coding to kind of um, illustrate what I'm trying to, to say here. Um, but if we, um, you know, so with this uh, particular um, uh, example of emotional AI, uh, essentially the premise behind it is that the facial expressions of an individual reveal um, these basic emotions. So how they are feeling at any particular moment. Um, and there have been serious 
questions regarding that premise, that uh, methodology or understanding that grounds um, the technological developments. Um, so now within, okay, I suppose, an accuracy perspective from the data side, um, the data might be perfectly accurate in that uh, the detection of the facial expressions uh, might be flawless, but the underlying methodology or the correlation between those uh, facial expressions and uh, the emotion that the individual um, is actually feeling may not uh, be correct. So there is a question as to whether data protection um, is the appropriate lens through which to consider this potential fault or this particular, particular problem. So that kind of leads me then um, to this point. So if data protection isn't the solution, how do we kind of regulate the potential for garbage in the middle? Yeah, so we can see a role for data protection as an input, you know, when personal data is an input, and for data protection when there are sensitive personal um, data outputs or inferences that are drawn through this detailed um, complex processing. But what about regulating the machine learning model in the middle that might be, um, you know, uh, flawed in terms of its fundamental reasoning as to how it is drawing these inferences in the first place? So this is kind of, um, you know, where um, I am at the moment in terms of this research and where I'm going. But I, I'd like to kind of maybe spell out in the last few slides exactly where my thinking is and uh, where the, the progress uh, for the future research that I'm doing uh, and how it's going to tie in with this. So um, the first thing to mention, and you know, we need to I mean, consider some of the regulatory developments that are happening in this space, is that the proposed AI Act um, in the EU is essentially suggesting that there should be transparency requirements uh, for um, technologies, including emotional AI. Why this is uh, interesting um, in particular is that there have been a series of um, reports, I suppose, from policymakers, um, but also enforcement authorities actually calling for a ban of these technologies. Um, and that has kind of led me to kind of question, OK, in what, how should we regulate, you know, that the, the potential garbage in the middle? Um, these uh, enforcement authorities, so the European Data Protection Board and the European Data Protection Super Supervisor, for instance, are suggesting this ban, but um, how does that kind of fit together? How should we uh, view this? Uh, and that has led to me kind of um, coming up with a few different questions um, that I am particularly interested in. Um, so I suppose one of the fundamental ones um, that is, uh, I guess, to a certain extent, plaguing me at the moment is, you know, do we want policymakers uh, deciding on, you know, uh, what could be construed as scientific debates? So the merits of different technologies uh, from a purely scientific perspective. And within that, in the context of emotional AI, you can question whether it is a scientific debate at all. Yeah, there are some who say that it is purely a pseudoscience um, and that's it. There are others who say, okay, well, there are fundamental flaws in some of the technologies that have been developed, but this is an evolving space. And so, you know, um, there is a scientific debate to be had. Um, now, you know, the, I, the second bullet point there kind of points to, I suppose, uh, some of the complexities that underpin that, you know, so uh, the fact that some of the criticisms uh, don't really narrow down on what they're criticizing, whether it be it the underlying methodology or um, for facial action coding in particular. And, uh, you know, the point within that is that policymakers are often probably not best placed um, to recognize recognize the nuances in these types of arguments. Um, and you can question whether it is actually the appropriate place to have uh, these types of discussions then. Um, so, you know, this has kind of led then to, uh, to me considering um, the broader um, uh, implications of the research that um, uh, on this particular area, um, more uh, specifically focusing on, you know, how we might go about regulating inaccuracy more generally. Um, Emotion AI might be just one example of it uh, and how we kind of start to think about um, how we regulate um, inaccuracy, how we've regulated in the past. Um, and I suppose one of the fundamental things that I want to, that I noticed, or I suppose, which is obvious, is that inaccuracy is everywhere in consumer products. So the fact that we have some, you know, newfangled technology um, with, you know, um, AI in the title that uh, is suddenly inaccurate um, isn't particularly unique um, uh, in this space. The next one is that 
you know, there are a range of harmful products or services um, that are easily accessible to, uh, to consumers. Um, now, there may be, uh, for instance, certain restrictions on the access to certain um, harmful products, uh, for instance, alcohol or tobacco, but um, there are uh, extremely harmful products um, that are left open to the general public. Um, so what would be unique about regulating a particular technology um, uh, broad scale uh, through the through uh, actually banning it like emotional AI. Um, the next thing I suppose um, that I'm starting to think about a little bit is if there is a difference between banning uh, a um, you know a product or a service uh, versus banning uh, a particular technology. And if that actually matters, yeah. So I suppose within this, I'm starting to kind of question whether um, there could be a shifting regulatory target when we're talking about a specific uh, deployment of technology, um, you know, um, uh, as opposed to particular types of products that uh, we may, um, or services that we may have regulated in the past, um, that may make it far more difficult to um, effectively uh, regulate the inaccuracy through bans uh, in this particular context. Um, okay, so then, you know, the final uh, points that I kind of want to highlight is really, you know, the, the where from here, you know, um, what I'm kind of uh, focused on and, um, you know, part of this research that's kind of moving into the future of it, uh, I'll be doing with um, Professor Jeannie Patterson at uh, University of Melbourne, where we're going to be kind of looking at um, this issue through a broader uh, regulatory lens, um, you know, so looking at existing contract law mechanisms, but also, for instance, protections that may exist in consumer law to look at, for instance, misrepresentations in the capacity of uh, these particular uh, um, uh, technologies, may perhaps contained in terms of conditions or the potential for the application of consumer protection mechanisms around misleading or deceptive conduct, uh, but also the potential role for the application of unfair terms regulations, um, also down to, you know, the unfair trading provisions that uh, exist for instance, in the EU or the US, um, but also within this to view and understand more uh, other ex ante uh, means of regulating, um, in addition to data protection and data protection accuracy mechanisms, uh, such as consumer guarantees law, uh, and whether there could be kind of a more principled based regulatory intervention compared to outright bans of specific uh, technological developments. Um, and, but within that, we also still want to look at this role for uh, more paternalistic means of intervention, uh, more specifically bans uh, in the circumstances of where and when they should happen, um, even for, um, you know, um, as I mentioned, for very harmful products, there may, may not be whole scale bans. And we need to kind of explore those kind of trade offs in order to determine okay, on what point of this kind of paternalism empowerment scale do we need to uh, land on in order to effectively regulate these types of technologies? So um, I think that that uh, is kind of bringing me to the the end of what I wanted to say. I realized that I kind of, you know, kept that uh, very much within time, but that then allows us for a more elaborate discussion, which I think is is good. Um, and I'm happy to kind of elaborate on any of the, the parts. I think it's kind of like wind me up and watch me go, I think, with this particular topic. So like, um, I'm happy to expand on any particular areas if anyone has uh, particular questions. So thank you. Okay, uh, thank you uh, so much, Damien, for uh, a really nice uh, introduction to this um, research project. Uh, as a reminder to the participants uh, in the room, uh, you can use the Q&A box to uh, pose questions or if there's an area you want Damien to, if you want to wind him up and let him run uh, in a particular area, just, just let him know up in the Q&A box there. I will uh, use the, the chair's privilege to ask uh, uh, my my main question, really, which is, um, so I'm not a scholar of privacy. I'm more, I think, if you were to characterize me as a scholar of innovation. So I think about these things maybe from a different perspective. Um, and I guess my question is is kind of like, do we even need to worry about regulating inaccuracy in this in these sorts of contexts, given that we can probably assume there's a built-in market incentive? for accuracy, right? Uh, the people who develop these technologies 
want them to be accurate. If I'm building an emotional AI, I want it to do its job well. If I'm building a, a behavioral advertising algorithm, I want it to accurately target the advertisements that it, it, it chooses for particular users. Um, and we know just from the history of innovation that almost all technologies, they, they develop incrementally. They start off as sort of poor versions of themselves. And over time, as market incentives sort of take their effect and the engineering kinks get ironed out, the technologies get progressively better and, and better and more, ac in this case, would be more accurate and more accurate. And, and I wonder whether or not even introducing the, the threat of, as you said, banning inaccuracy might upset those market incentives and lead us to miss out on technologies that, that might turn out to be very, very, very helpful for a lot of contexts that they're maybe not even now applied in. Like I could think of a lot of different contexts where a, a truly accurate uh, emotional AI engine would be very, very useful and have a lot of uh, uh, good uses, good things that we would mostly think of as ethical or moral uses that would uh, help benefit society. So there's, there's quite a bit there, but I just wonder what your responses are to, to those thoughts. Yeah, no, thanks very much for that. I think um, to a large, like, I think you've um, eloquently uh, expressed a concern that I had, you know, stemming from the, the calls in the European Union to ban uh, this particular technology. Um, you know, I say that as someone who is quite skeptical of like current developments, um, and I, I I definitely take your point. I mean, I suppose that was kind of like the the starting point for this, and that like um, moves towards a ban is an extreme regulatory outcome. Like it's an ex you know, there's a lot in terms of the reg regulatory spectrum in terms of interventions that you can have that don't go as far as banning an entire technology. Um, and I guess that that kind of started um, uh, this project out, you know, so um, looking at more ex-ante principle-based ways of mitigating the impacts of inaccuracy. Um, now, I take your, your point that businesses themselves want to avoid it, because yeah, the better product that they have, the more they'll be able to sell it, essentially. So the market essentially should at least, in theory, take care of it. Um, now, the one thing I would say um, to kind of maybe draw back a little bit of what I've said um, is that like you know there are particular uses of this technology that are particularly problematic yeah where inaccuracy could play um a fairly uh i mean it could have fairly massive negative impacts yeah so if you're talking about using this to you know surveil public spaces for instance um now granted this is all about particular uses yeah um, i mean you can have moratoriums on particular uses of the technology um and I, I think that that's kind of part of the spectrum of regulatory responses that i'm interested in you know there's nothing particularly wrong with um in my view of having it as part of a kind of a gaming feature uh for instance in a video game um now obviously you still have those lingering challenges associated with what is known as function creep yeah, so you use it for one thing and then it just expands in terms of its uses. Um, but I think that that's a different regulatory target to the technology being inaccurate, um, if that makes sense. So I kind of, you know, um, I agree with you and then I've kind of expanded to a certain extent. So I hope that that kind of, um, you know, gives you, a, an under, you know, an understanding of my position. Absolutely, yes. I, I sort of picked up implicitly on on that uh, perspective that you presented when you talked about your your hesitancy about perhaps the European approach to banning specific technologies, especially at the sort of early stages in their development and the potential follow on costs that might have for society. We do have uh, some questions in the Q and A box uh, now. So TG has listed three questions. Um, I'll, I'll read them all. Some of them I think you've maybe already um, started to address. The first one I think is related to what we were just talking about, where TG asks whether or not companies who are developing AI systems are already sort of self-regulating by basically doing A-B testing. So like, they're just they're trying to make their products better. So I think the question here is basically the same. It's like, do we even need to, to intervene in these contexts when, when companies already are concerned about this? The, the second question is, is quite broad. Uh, TG asks whether or not there's a, a regulatory technology or a reg tech solution to, to regulate accuracy. Um, the third question I think is maybe uh, the most interesting here is, is whether or not um, regulating disclosure or transparency might um, upset the market and allow some companies to, to benefit off of the work done by their competitors, right? So if 
if there is a disclosure regime that requires companies to disclose how their, their black box algorithm works, does that then put them at a competitive disadvantage because their uh, competitors don't need to reverse engineer it, they can see it, it's all been disclosed to them. And mm -hmm. does that then itself perhaps uh, undermine incentives to produce good algorithms because you're not able to internalize the benefit of the algorithm. So there's quite a bit there. You're free to sort of answer any of those, all of those uh, as you, you like. Yeah, I suppose I'll, I'll maybe um, respond to the, to the last question first then. Um, I mean, I think yes, but uh, uh, to a certain extent, I mean, um, entire transparency um, would uh, disincentivize um, innovation in that sense. But I suppose, you know, it isn't, um, it is an all or nothing. It's essentially my, my very brief response to that. You know, if you think about like transparency around, um, say, automated individual decision making in the GDPR, um, you can have layering of information. It, it might only be the information that is needed for the consumer to have some idea of how their information is being processed without necessarily revealing the trade secrets that might go behind it. Um, you know, there's a broader discussion here about uh, things I'm less versed in as to whether, you know, um, uh, you know, there's a, a broader need for um, powers, regulatory powers to step in and kind of examine, I suppose, what's happening underneath the hood. Um, I think, you know, again, that's kind of a more graduated response than saying whole scale, you have to publish everything online. Um, it's more kind of, okay, well, there are restricted powers to investigate in certain circumstances. Um, so I think like, you know, my response to that third question is essentially that there's a potential spectrum uh, when it comes to transparency and it isn't, you know, entire transparency or nothing at all. Um, so that's kind of maybe, you know, a fairly simple answer, but I think that there's some weight to it. Um, you know, in terms of the reg, reg tech solution for regulating accuracy, um, I'm not entirely sure, you know, it might depend a little bit on, um, you know, the that difference of, say, if we take the emotional AI context, whether there's a flaw within the underlying uh, premise of the technology. So in the methodology that's actually being used or not, um, you know, I think that that would be fairly clear uh, based on the the type of work that's actually going there. But if it's less based on the fundamental approach, the methodology, then it can become a little bit more difficult, perhaps. And then you may need technical innovations in order to figure out what precisely went wrong. But again, I'm, you know, I think that that's more of a computer science question than a law question or regulatory question. Proceed. Sure. Right, so we we have another question uh, here, which I think it, it raises something you uh, you briefly uh, discussed before, which was about the use of these technologies in video games, where you suggested maybe there's less of a concern there than in other maybe more more sensitive areas. But William Lamb asks, um, what if the there's sort of a transition towards what people call the metaverse, obviously. That can mean different things to different people. But I think implicit in this question is what happens if and when, I'll, I'll use the if because I don't know that it's uh, predetermined, but if a lot of more of our social behavior starts to take place in, in game-like context, virtual reality, whatever you want to call it, um, thereby making more of these the applications of these, these technologies potentially um, it gives them more power to, to sort of influence the day-to-day -day activities of our lives that aren't just recreational. Maybe it's uh, uh, quite important things like, you know, meeting of our lovers, et cetera, things like that, uh, really important personal experiences. Um, are, do, do the considerations change in a context like that? Does it, does it, do your concerns change? Um, yes. I mean, I think that they shift to concerns. I mean, uh, concerns about our capacity to make decisions for ourselves, essentially. Yeah? So, I mean, they become a lot about autonomy. Um, and I think like, you know, the, there's already debates about this in terms of the effects of a mediated environment when you can personalize content um, and potentially, I mean, depending on your, your way of viewing this, I mean, some would say manipulate behavior, uh, depending on the context of the personalization. And some of the, the examples I showed at the very beginning, you know, whether it be the kind of Cambridge Analytica or the emotional contagion experiment kind of point to those types of things, the risk of, you know, the impacts and autonomous decision-making capacity of individuals. Um, and, you know, you could 
see that with in you know the market yeah so can they effectively choose the products that they want are they even aware that they're potentially being manipulated um you know can they even retrospectively say that they didn't want a particular product uh, or service or whatever it is it is so certainly um i think that those things kind of feature in um and to a large extent i think that they relate as well to uh, the points I kind of hinted at around um, function creep. Yeah, so, I mean, you can think, as you said uh, in your first question, I think, um, that there are, uh, you can point at legitimate uh, ethical uses of this technology when it's accurate. You know, I mean, you can think of potentially healthcare uh, applications as a particular context. Um, but it's when, um, you know, uh, the data from one particular context starts to seep in terms of usages, uh, to kind of have some sort of an influence or a direct uh, behavior around commercial decision making that I really think then you have, uh, you know, it starts to, to, to play some sort of significant role. So, um, again, I think hopefully it kind of gives you an idea of what uh, I'm thinking then. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have another question here from uh, anonymous attendee who uh, the premise is that most data protection laws provide a right to correct or rectify inaccurate personal data that's collected about an individual. Uh, and then the question is, in the case of inaccurate inferred data, how or would it even be possible? Could, daters, could data users be able to honor such requests? So would they have to, I guess, tweak the algorithm somehow at the individual level? Um, bite the algorithm and retrain their model? Like, is there is there any thoughts about how the engineering or actual, like, functionally that could take place uh i mean i i suppose it depends on what point you're deleting yeah so if it's in terms of the impacts of an inference um then you can maybe change the outcome yeah if it has to do with okay um you know various aggregated data um are collected in order to you know um train the model uh then it's going to be very difficult to kind of remove anything from you know uh uh, that particular stage yeah so if you're thinking about like okay uh the impacts of this in terms of the inference that it draws and then the potential decision that comes out of it i think you're kind of circling back to automated decision making type of protections um where there's been a massive discussion around you know right to explanation and all that kind of stuff but also the right to kind of contest a particular outcome um you know it might be that you know um requesting the deletion of that particular information isn't actually the most effective outcome it's to change the outcome that was reached, uh, or at least to be able to challenge the outcome. Um, I think that that kind of depends on the context a little bit and the application that you're talking about. But um, I would say that, you know, um, yeah, maybe uh, maybe the, the deletion of inaccurate inferences isn't, um, you know, the, the most appropriate outcome that you would be seeking. Um, so that, that, I'll, that exhausts the currently asked questions. I'll ask another uh, follow-up question, but I'll also in, invite uh, attendees. If you have questions, feel free to, to add them to that Q&A box. It's down at the bottom of your, your Zoom window here. Um, so, so one question I have, I guess, is like, so we were just talking about the ability of users to potentially correct incorrect data or incorrect uh, predictions or inferences uh, about them that these... Um, whatever you want to call it, emotional AI, AI in general, uh, might produce. Do, do you think it might be useful to allow users to, to choose how much inaccuracy they're willing to tolerate? Because some people don't care, right? Some people really have, uh, they don't really care. They, you know, if you want to have, make inaccurate emotional inferences about me or serve me bad ads because of your behavior algorithm, it doesn't matter to me very much. But some other people might actually feel very strongly about these things. And so is there a, a, a mechanism whereby the regulation could take those considerations into account and allow people to sort of tailor the amount of inaccuracy they're exposed to? Or do you think that maybe overcomplicates things? Well, I mean, I think maybe even the um, proposed approach in the uh, proposed AI Act actually kind of does that because it says that you need to be transparent. I mean, what you probably have to add is, um, you know, some information on the, the potential for inaccuracy. Yeah, so some statistical, um, I don't know, transparency obligation that would say that you have to provide this type of information. Now, how you would actually practically realize that becomes a little bit difficult because it might be a little bit context dependent. Um, but um, in saying that, I mean, like, you know, that would be, 
I mean, legally speaking, I think that that's the way you would do it. Yeah, you, um, from you know, uh, if we're supposed to be active market participants, you provide the information to the consumers, and they effectively choose. Now, there's a you know a well versed criticism of that, and that individuals have absolutely no idea what's going on, and they don't actively choose. Um, or you know, you could say that they actively uh, choose not to be choosing or be informed yeah um so i think within this and i think it kind of underlines um you know the emphasis of the the project you know where this project is going is trying to kind of find that um the right spot along the spectrum between empowerment and paternalism so mm. you know how much paternalism is actually necessary depending on the the, the risk associated with a particular technology and you know i guess the feeling um that i have and i try to kind of maybe convey this through some of the answers and also the presentation is that i don't think wholesale bans um are granular enough to kind of respect that paternalism empowerment divide that you need to think about things a little with a bit more nuance um in order to kind of respect both the fact that you know consumer policy is there to protect individuals uh, from themselves but also you know, from, I suppose, different types of harm, but also to promote individual autonomous decision-making capacity. I mean, it has uh, multiple policy aims. Um, and, you know, the protection of an autonomous capacity to choose is an important goal in itself. Um, so I, I do think that when you're trying to figure out, okay, where on the spectrum, you know, you want to lie, you have to kind of, yeah, you, know, you have to explore those kind of theoretical debates, I suppose, that, um are familiar, I suppose, to, to scholars in consumer protection, but also to a certain extent in data protection and privacy as well. Great, thanks. Um, I got a sort of another follow-up question to that, I guess, which uh, is to kind of a fundamental premise, which is like, who decides who's accurate in these, what what is accurate in these contexts? So I can think of at least three actors or, or entities that that might be the important decision makers here right so one is the individual in question obviously and that's the most obvious one right that i should decide what's accurate uh in these things that are inferred about me um another is the the inferrer right they may have a different opinion about what's accurate um because they have different use cases right maybe that their their use for their purposes their prediction might be perceived by them to be accurate but by me to be inaccurate and a third is you suggested earlier in response, I think maybe to one of TG's questions that maybe there was some room here for like a regulatory uh, intervention and maybe there were, you could have, I, I don't know, I, I, I called them in my mind like the algorithm police who could go in and, and look into the black box and see what's going on. And so maybe they could be a, a third party uh, in this context who, who might have a useful perspective on, on what's accurate and what's inaccurate. Um, is there an overarching answer to that question? Or again, is it one of those like, this is really context dependent and it, it varies based on the technology in question and the application in question? Um, I mean, I do think it's context dependent, but I do think that it could ground, I suppose, regulatory responses. Yeah, so, um, you know, if you know that um, the inaccuracy is inbuilt, yeah, so there's a fundamental flaw in what you're deploying. Um, then you can think about like you know other means of regulating that we have um already have seen consumer protection or in, say product liability or whatever else so like you know we have mechanisms in order to respond to some of these things and as well like thinking about their deployment to a certain extent um and you know you know this potential for like the the algorithm police to kind of come in um i would say that like i'd be kind of hesitant um to a large extent um i think it kind of um there may be certain contexts and certain uses that we say okay well um because accuracy is an issue here we simply can't deploy it because the it's too risky yeah i'm not entirely sure if that's actually within consumer products yeah i mean we can think of emotional ai uses that extend far beyond what we as consumers might purchase um either you know embedded in products or as, as services online um, you know, be it in kind of, you know, the policing national security space, um, where the potential for error and the risk of error, you know, is, uh, I suppose, and the risks associated with error um, increase dramatically. Yeah. Um, so I would be kind of um, thinking more on the lines of if there are going to be regulatory interventions, we have to think about, okay, well, in 
where is the risk calculus the worst? Um, and does that justify, you know, something like a moratorium on the use of that technology in that particular context, rather than empowering, um, you know, a, a regulator necessarily to kind of step in and say, okay, well, this is only 59.5% accurate, therefore it shouldn't be served to consumers, you know, because it, like, uh, I, I think that um, it, it also just wouldn't result in a regulatory outcome that would be economical for the want of a better, you know, for just, yeah, and there are other concerns as well, I think. Um, great, thank you. That's uh, very useful. We are getting close to the end of time, but we have another question by either the same or a different anonymous attendee here, which is whether or not emotions actually qualify as uh, personal data under current data protection regimes. I don't know the answer to that, but do you? Uh, yeah, well, I've uh, I've already written on this. So there's a, this paper, well, a book chapter that I wrote, um, uh, kind of dealing, I suppose, with some of these kind of basic questions as well. So um, it, it will be personal information or personal data. I think uh, that's not particularly difficult to find, particularly in, in the EU. Um, I think where uh, it gets a little bit more difficult is whether it's sensitive personal information. Um, you know, and here you kind of end up with questions like, well, okay, um, you know, uh, are, emo uh, I suppose, inferences relating to someone's emotions, can they be classified as health-related information, which would be classified as sensitive information? Or if you look at particular deployments of emotional AI, say through facial action coding, it'll be clear that they'll probably be using biometric templates, which are generally, uh, if you look at various data protection uh, frameworks, they're classified as sensitive information. Whereas if they're using uh, other means of detection that don't involve the use of biometrics, then there may be more questions. Yeah? So then it's just a question of whether it's health data or not health data. Um, so I think, yeah, uh, my answer to that is kind of simple, like, uh, um, you know, the it will be classified as um, these technologies will be using personal data. It's more of a question whether they're using sensitive personal data, and that may depend on the context and whether you view the insights that it um, derives to be kind of any way related to health and falling within the sensitive data category, or whether they're using, you know, a particular biometric information which would otherwise bring it within the definition of personal, uh, sensitive personal information. Um, so I hope that that kind of um, answers it. Yeah, I think it does. I know more about it now than I did two minutes ago. So thank you. Um, uh, maybe this might be the last question because we're down to the last few minutes of the hour. Um, but uh, so Chichi asked a question that, and this comes up, right? Sometimes this is people's response uh, to these, these thorny questions of, of privacy is, is maybe we should just mandate uh, uh, anonymization, right? So that you can no longer associate users with their data. It's it's challenging for a number of reasons, but I wonder what your response to that is. Um, I mean, I suppose to a certain extent, you can say that it kind of is already somewhat in the frameworks in that like, if you want to avoid the scope of data protection law, um, you render the data anonymous and then it doesn't come within it and then you can do whatever you want. Um, and there, as there are requirements to delete information, if you process if you process it uh, so that it is anonymous, um, then you know it's not going to come within the scope of uh, the statutory framework. Now, in saying that, I think that that's like far easier said than done, um, because like you know, there's kind of a utility anonymization uh, balancing. Yeah, you want the information to be useful and for it to be useful you need to be able to drive some sort of uh, inferences or whatever or you need to be able to relate it to some individual um which basically means that you it can't be anonymous um you know i mean there are discussions around pseudonymization um and uh, you know depending on the jurisdiction you're in whether pseudonymous information comes within the definition of personal data um i think the general consensus is uh, within these frameworks is that generally it does because the impact of its use will still be the same as to whether it's pseudonymous or not. But I think with this anonymization point, um, I think really, as soon as you start thinking about anonymization, you have a real impact on the utility of the information that you've gathered, which then kind of undercuts the purposes for which you might be gathering it in the first place, um, which renders it kind of um, very difficult. Um, so I hope that that has kind of answered it, and uh, it's probably a nice way to end as well.
yeah, it was a, a good uh, way of showing like the competing interests between anonymization and utility. I like how you put that. Okay, so uh, we're basically out of time there. Uh, that, that hour flew by, Damien. It was very, very fascinating. So thank you so much on behalf of HKU and the Law and Technology Center for presenting your research and entertaining our questions. And uh, thank you to all the attendees for uh, attending and for your great questions. And we hope to see you all at a future uh, HKU Law and Law and Technology Talks. Okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. Take care. Bye -bye.